talking somewhat topically, and we are going to look at a number of verses, but I just thought I'd start off by reading um, from Psalm 119, verse 72. If we ask ourselves the question, why did the, the author of this particular psalm have such a high regard for the Word of God? It's because of the illuminating work of the Holy Spirit. That is the only reason that he had this love. But that's what we want to focus on is a love for the Word because the more we love the Word of God, the more we're going to get into the Word of God, the more we're going to be strengthened by the Word of God, the, the stronger our faith also is going to be in what the Word of God says. This all comes from the illuminating work of the Holy Spirit. Well, let me uh, begin by reading a section of Psalm 119, uh, verses 65 through 72. And I chose it mainly because of verse 72. Psalmist writes this, You have dealt well with your servant, O Lord, according to your word. Teach me good discernment and knowledge, for I believe in your commandments. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. You are good and do good. Teach me your statutes. The arrogant have forged a lie against me. With all my heart, I will observe your precepts. Their heart is covered with fat, but I delight in your law. It was good for me that I was afflicted, that I may learn your statutes. The law of your mouth is better to me than thousands of gold and silver pieces. Now, I've read several passages that deal with that particular idea. Why the comparison to gold and silver? Well, that's because that's what the world is seeking after. But those who love the Lord find something else to be much more valuable than that, and that is God's Word. One other thing that we saw in Psalm 19 is the idea of the sweetness of God's Word. It's sort of a relish. You know what it is when you taste something that's really sweet and how, at least in uh, <laughs> most of us, Enjoy that taste. You know, we, we relish it. That's one of the reasons why we struggle with uh, the sugar and the addiction, perhaps, to sugar. But uh, the Word of God is likened to sweetness. It's likened to honey uh, and sweeter than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb because of the relish the soul that is illumined by the Holy Spirit has for the Word of God. And again, the more we have the Spirit's work, the more we will relish what the Word of God says. And again, that is what the enemy is going to attack. He's going to try to keep us from having that influence of the Holy Spirit. Well, we saw this morning, again, remember, that the enemy, our enemy, is continually seeking to get us and others to do what God tells us, what He warns us not to do at the end of the book of Revelation and other parts of Scripture, and that is to add to or to take away from the Scriptures. Remember, John warned that if we add to his revelation, book of Revelation, that God would apply the judgments that are in that book to us, and if we are to take away from it, that he would take away our part from the heavenly city and the tree of life. Again, remembering that the only people who would actually do that are people who don't know the Lord. But the point was that changing God's word is a very serious sin. Uh, what John writes at the end of the book of Revelation is what we call the canonical curse. It's essentially don't mess with the standard. The canon of scriptures, you know, canon means rule, it means standard. The 66 books are that rule or that standard that God has given to us. He says, do not change what I have given to you. He says, I will judge anyone who tampers with my word. And again, not just the book of Revelation but any book in the canon of Scripture. Now, we saw that it was important that we aren't guilty of this. Now, we may not literally change the Word of God, go in here and rewrite it, although there are people certainly who do, but he's warning us against changing these things in our own understanding. You know, we don't want to misunderstand. We don't want to change what we know the Word of God says. And it's important to us that we don't change these things not only for the sake of our salvation, but also for the sake of our fruitfulness and well-being, having come to the Lord Jesus. Remember, we saw this morning 
that there are particular things that the Word of God teaches, teaches quite a bit of things, but there are particular things that we must believe in order to be saved. And those are the things we particularly don't want to change. We have to believe the Bible is the Word of God, that this is the canon that He has given to us, the standard. We have to believe that the true God, the only God that exists, is triune. We have to believe that Jesus is the eternal Son of God who became a man and came into this world by being born of a virgin, that He came in order to guarantee the blessings of salvation for us through His obedience and through His death on the cross, and that we can only receive what He did. We can only be justified. We can only be saved by grace through faith alone, understanding that that faith that saves is not a faith that is alone, but it's always accompanied by a change of life, by good works, because of the illuminating work of the Holy Spirit. And so we asked the question this morning, is it any wonder that this is where the devil attacks? That this is essentially what the cults attack, the particular teachings of Scripture. We noted that the devil essentially moves them to do this to keep them away from the truth so that they cannot be saved. Jehovah's Witnesses deny the Trinity, they deny Jesus' divinity, and uh, you'll notice if you've ever read any of their publications that just about every single one of them, although I haven't read all of them, will attack those two truths, the Trinity and the deity of Jesus Christ. Why are they doing that? Because the devil's behind it. He wants to keep them deceived and to keep them from coming to Christ. They also, of course, deny the fact that we are justified by faith alone, but even if they did believe that, Having the wrong God and the wrong Jesus, they could not be saved. Mormons deny that there is one God. They believe the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are three separate gods. The God that they call the Father is essentially a glorified man who was created by another God. And they believe that we are saved by being baptized in the Mormon church. Islam denies the Trinity, the deity of Christ, and salvation or justification by faith alone. The Roman church denies justification by faith alone. Um, as we know, these have all added to the Bible. And by adding their particular revelations and their particular works have essentially ripped the heart out of the Bible. Not literally, but in, of course, the understanding of those who listen to them. Satan has succeeded in deceiving them. He's also succeeded in taking the truth completely away from other groups such as atheists, liberals, and the neo-orthodox. And that's something he also attempts to do to us. Now again, thankfully, he cannot take away the gospel from us. He cannot destroy us if we belong to Jesus Christ. We will never stop believing the truths we need to be saved because the Spirit of God will continue to uphold those things in our thinking. But we do know that he can weaken us and make us less fruitful by changing our understanding of what God says in his words. We saw some examples of how he does this in the church, how he tempts true believers to add to the word of God uh, in one way by um, uh, the belief in the continuance of charismatic gifts. See, if those gifts were essentially meant to form the foundation of the scriptures, and to verify that, and the scriptures are complete, and the gifts have ceased, then those who claim to have the gifts cannot really have the gifts from the Lord. And we saw this morning different examples of how they're adding to the scriptures. I gave you some personal examples from my own life. can actually uh, hurt in, in a variety of ways. Uh, they can draw us into the world by the, the, the teaching that... You know, we ought to be, God wants us to be healthy and he wants us to be wealthy. Uh, we've also seen that just simply uh, denying the word of God and relying upon the gifts can uh, really lead us to trust in our own subjective understanding or feelings of what God wants us to do. Uh, and we'll determine what's good and what's bad by what we feel is good or bad. That's not how the Lord wants us to determine truth. He wants us to do it from the scripture he also knows that he can persuade us to believe things contrary to his word if we can just get someone, if he can get someone we respect, to believe and to teach it. How many high-profile 
Bible teachers have also led people into error. I mean, many of the ones who are in Christian television are doing exactly that. Now, again, the devil cannot ruin us if we've trusted Jesus, but he can hurt us by keeping us ignorant of what the Bible really says. He can weaken us and make us less of a threat to what he's trying to do in the world. Now, this, what we talked about this morning, what I've just reviewed, these are attacks on what we call the inspiration of Scripture. This evening, we want to consider one further tactic that he uses. He not only attacks the inspiration of the Bible, he also fights against illumination, the illuminating work of the Holy Spirit. He not only tries to twist the meaning of Scripture in our minds, he works on our hearts to try to keep us out of the Word. If he can basically dampen our love for the Lord, he will dampen our desire to be in the Word of God. Now, illumination, this is going to be review, I think, for many of you, is different than inspiration. Inspiration is something that applies only to the 66 books of the Bible. It is how God communicated information to his people. It was the Holy Spirit's work of superintending or overseeing everything that went into the production of these 66 books, including the author's life, uh, their upbringing, their education, the situations into which they wrote, and the very words that they penned so that the words that they wrote are at the same time completely those of the human author as well as completely those of God. You know, we ask the question, how much man, how much God? Well, it's 100% man, 100% God. The Spirit of God was working, making sure that everything the author wrote was exactly what he intended to be written, and yet it was coming out of the mind and heart of the author himself. Peter writes in 2 Peter 1, verses 20 and 21, but know this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation, for no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men, moved by the Holy Spirit, spoke from God. Paul told us this morning that what they wrote was breathed out by God. So inspiration applies only to the Scriptures, really. And it's that process by which the Holy Spirit moved on them to write exactly what they wrote so that we would have God's Word. Now, illumination is the Spirit's work in our lives and in the lives, of course, of everyone who belongs to the Lord Jesus. The illuminating work of the Holy Spirit does not convey new information, but rather gives us a love for the information that He has already given it's the Spirit's opening our eyes to see what the Word of God actually is, to see His glory, and to see the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ to show us that this is not like anything else that we've read. It's not like reading Dickens. It's not like reading any other author. It has a different quality, a different character, and the reason why we see that is because of the Spirit's work, and that work of the Holy Spirit gives us a desire to read this word. It gives us a desire to draw near to the Lord. Uh, Jesus said to the Jews that followed him when he fed them in the wilderness these words, John 6, 26. Truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. But he also told them this, that they needed more than the desire for physical food if they were truly to come to Him. You know, people come to Jesus for a variety of reasons. This large crowd was coming to Him because they wanted more food. You know, make some more bread, make some more fish, feed us again. But Jesus said that kind of coming is not the kind of coming that you need. This is the kind of coming you need in verses 44 and 45 where He says, no one can come to Me. And He was talking to those who already had at least for the fish and the, and the bread, unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, 
and they shall all be taught of God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Now, what is it that Jesus was talking about there? He was talking about the illuminating work of the Holy Spirit. This is how the Father does this work. This is how he teaches. This is how we hear in this kind of way. This is how we learn is through the work of the Holy Spirit. Now, it's this change that the Spirit makes, this illuminating work again, that also gives us the conviction of the reality of what the Scripture says. That's why when we look at it, we don't look at it as a fairy tale, as a legend, but as something that really took place. And that what it tells us about the future is something that is really going to take place. Paul tells us about that in, in the, um, his letter, the first letter to the Corinthians in chapter 2, verses 9 through 12. He says, As it is written, Things which eye has not seen and ear has not heard and which have not entered the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who love him. For to us, God revealed them through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, the thoughts of God no one knows except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, so that we may know the things freely given to us by God. Now Paul's telling us two things here. He's telling us that the Spirit is a person. He's searching the thoughts of God. He's telling us the Spirit is God because he comprehends the depths of God and really only one who is infinite can do that. But he's also telling us that the Spirit of God is the one the Father sends to reveal the things that are freely given to us by God. He is the one who opens our eyes to the reality and the truth of these things. That's why we believe it and why others don't believe it. The work we're talking about here is that work that Jesus was talking to Nicodemus about, the new birth that produces faith. Faith is essentially the belief that what the Word of God says is true. Remember what Jesus said in John 3, verse 5. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven well, we can only enter into the kingdom of heaven through Jesus, and that by faith. Well, the Lord creates this faith in our hearts through the water of the word. I, I think that that's what's being referred to there by water. I know there's a variety of interpretations of that, but the word of God is often referred to as water in Scripture and that we must be born of this water, of this word, and the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit. Through the word and by the Holy Spirit, Faith is created in the Lord Jesus Christ. We trust in him and enter into the kingdom of heaven. So the, the illuminating work of the Spirit of God gives to us a love for the word of God because we see the beauty of the Lord in it. It gives to us faith that these things are real so that we will trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. But this work of the Spirit also strengthens our focus on the word of God because now that we love it, and now that we believe it, we want to know what it says. That's why we read the Bible, because we want to know what it says about God. We want to learn more about this one who loved us and sent his son. We want to have this fellowship with him, and we want to know how he tells us to live. The illuminating work of the Holy Spirit really draws us in towards the things that strengthen us that will make us more like Jesus, not just the Word of God, but, but everything that the Spirit gives to us, that God gives to us to strengthen that work. Now, the point is this. That's why Satan wants to fight against that work of the Holy Spirit, because the more we have of it, the stronger we're going to be, and the more of a threat we're going to be to him. The more fruit we're going to bear, the more we're going to serve the Lord in his kingdom. Now, thankfully, this is something that Satan cannot take entirely away from us. He can't. If we've trusted Jesus, if we're saved, the Spirit is forever united to our souls. 
and that means he will forever illumine us. We will always have some faith. We will always have some love for God. We will always have some desire to serve him in his kingdom. But we can have more or less of that influence in our souls. And the effects of the Spirit's illuminating work will rise or fall with the influence of the Holy Spirit. So if Satan can weaken that influence, he can weaken our love for the Word, our conviction of its truth, and our sense of urgency for the things that it contains. And when our love and our faith is weakened, uh, the, the, the effect of it on us is going to be what we see happening in, in the churches today. We're going to sink down to live the, the kind of mundane life the people of this world are living. We're not, really not going to live any differently than they're living, living essentially for ourselves, uh, working each day, thinking only about the evening when we can kick back and, and maybe entertain ourselves with television, or working through the week in order to make it to the weekend so, again, we can enjoy recreation, or working through the year so that we can enjoy our vacation, or working throughout our lives so that we can enjoy a comfortable retirement. Now, there's nothing wrong with recreation, but if that's all we're after, if that's all we want, then something's wrong with that because our lives are not to be taken up in simply doing things for ourselves. We do things for ourselves as much as we need to in order to strengthen our ability to serve the Lord. If we don't have this illuminating work of the Holy Spirit, or if it's weakened and we're lower to this level, we're going to end up being concerned about the things Jesus told us not to be concerned about. He says, don't worry about the things that Gentiles worry about, what we're going to eat, what we're going to drink, what we're going to wear. Don't worry about money, whether or not you're going to have enough to survive, because the Lord says, I will take care of you. I will meet your needs if you put my kingdom first. If, again, we, we sink down to that level, then we're going to be concerned about our recreation. You know, whether or not we're going to be able to check all the items off of our bucket list before we check out of this world. You know, that's really not that important, is it? What's really important is how much we can do for the Lord before we leave this world. Now, again, this is how the majority of professing believers live today. Not seeking God's kingdom, but seeking their comfort on earth, which means that Satan is doing a good job of weakening the Spirit's influence in our lives. Now, this is what we need to, to combat. So how does Satan actually do this? How does he weaken the Spirit's influence in us? Well, he does it in the way you would suspect, by tempting us with the things of the world. And he tries to keep us we really immersed in those things and away from the things that will strengthen us, what we call the means of grace. So he uses the world to distract us. If he can, he tries to tempt us to sin. Satan's very good at that. Uh, he knows our weaknesses. He knows what to confront us with, what to perhaps introduce into our minds, what to bring in front of our attention to draw us away. But if he can't get us to sin, he also knows how to get us obsessed with things that aren't necessarily wrong or sinful, but that can become sinful to us if we become overly obsessed with them. And, you know, this is essentially what Bunyan, you know, Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress is really a book about the Christian life and spiritual warfare. It's how am I going to stay on this path and what is Satan going to bring against me in order to get me off this path? What we're talking about here is what he represents in Vanity Fair. Remember, Vanity Fair had all these different uh, streets you could go down. It had everything the world had to offer. It had things that were sinful, but it had things that weren't sinful, he said, in order to tempt pilgrims off the path and to stay in Vanity Fair so they wouldn't continue toward the celestial city. That is what Satan does. He he has built up the world in this world system in order to try to get us to stop making progress down the path. Now, if he can do that, if he can get us to sin, either by doing things that are wrong or by being obsessed with things that, that aren't necessarily wrong, but we love them too much, that 
quenches the Spirit's work in our souls, His influence. It dries it up. The Spirit's work is likened in Scripture to a fire that's burning in our souls. The more we have of this holy flame, the stronger our affections are going to burn for the Lord. But when we sin, it's like pouring water on that fire. Now, here's something else we need to be thankful for. I've already mentioned in Pilgrim's Progress, an interpreter's house, there was a, this fire that was burning, and there was a man who was standing in front of it pouring water on the fire. I don't know if you remember that, but the fire didn't go out. It didn't go out because there was somebody behind the wall that was secretly feeding fuel into the fire. And the, the whole purpose of it is Satan is trying to put this fire out, but Jesus is not going to let it go out. But that dynamic right there is what's going on. And we need to make sure that we're not cooperating with the devil to put that fire out. It's not going to go out, but it can still weaken that fire. And when that fire weakens, our affections weaken. And our zeal for the Lord weakens. It weakens our faith and our sense of the reality of the things that the Word of God is, is telling us and showing us. It's because of sin that the Spirit's influence is so weak in our lives, that we're not doing more than we are, that we're not more like Jesus than we are. Sin essentially puts us into a vicious circle, a downward spiral. When it quenches the Spirit's work, it makes us not want to use the means that God has given to us to get more of the Spirit's influence. When we are in sin, when we give in to Satan, when we fall to temptation, and we all do, we don't feel as much like reading the Bible. We don't feel so much like praying. We don't feel so much like singing praises to the Lord. And that's why we may often not feel like coming to worship the Lord on Sunday or coming to the midweek study in prayer because the Spirit's work is so low in our lives. So that's what Satan is going to do to attack us. And I think when we understand how that works, we begin to see how to overcome this particular attack of the enemy. The Lord tells us through Peter and through James, we need to resist the devil. We need to resist his temptations to sin. We need to resist the temptation to become overly infatuated with anything in this world that doesn't serve to draw us near to the Lord. You know, so things are, are typically not neutral. They're either taking us one direction or the other. We need to stay away from the things that are taking us away from God. We need to begin to do the things that draw us near. We need to devote ourselves to using the means of grace, reading the Word, praying, praising and worshiping the Lord. We need to get out of the vicious circle and enter into the virtuous circle. Now, we're not going to be able to do these things as we should right out of the gate. I think we need to understand that. If we're not disciplined, it's going to be hard even to start, but we need to start. And the more we do these things, the easier it will be to do these things because the more we do, the more of the Spirit's influence we'll gain and the more we're going to benefit from the things that we do. The more we read the Word of God, the more we're going to be able to focus on the Word of God, the more we're going to see the reality of the Word of God, the more we're going to love the Word of God, the more we're going to profit from the Word of God, the stronger our affections are going to grow. And again, that sense of the reality of these things that God reveals in His Word. The more we pray, the more we're going to want to pray, the more earnestly we will pray, the more our faith that our prayers will be answered is going to grow. And at the same time, the more we're going to see answers to those prayers. You know, George Mueller or Mueller, uh, I guess Mueller may be the correct pronunciation, but he was the gentleman that threw himself entirely on the Lord for the care of those orphans. I think, again, his, his example is amazing because here's a man who lived outside of the pages of Scripture, so to speak, and the Lord did amazing things through his life. Now, he prayed. He was known for his prayers. And the reason why his prayers were answered in such an amazing way was, first of all, because he prayed for the things God wanted to give him. 
He, you know, the Bible tells us when we pray according to the will of God, he hears us. But he was also heard because he had seen the Lord answer his prayers so many times. He had no doubt that God was going to answer him again. Now, this kind of faith did not come all at once. He did, wasn't born with this faith. He didn't have this kind of faith when uh, he was first converted to the Lord. It basically grew from his trusting the Lord for small things uh, before he was able to trust the Lord for great things. If you remember the story of his life, he early on decided, I'm going to devote my life to serving the Lord. And as he looked around, how can I serve the Lord? He saw all these orphans living on the street. He goes, somebody needs to take care of these. And the Lord tells us in his word, we need to take care of orphans and widows. So I'm going to establish orphanages. But instead of looking to people to take care of this need and to fund this need, I'm going to look to God to meet all of these needs. And so he did. He trusted the Lord for everything. And the Lord met those needs. Needs. I mean, even to the point where he asks things that we would never think about asking because we don't have the kind of faith to believe God would answer these kinds of prayers. And the Lord answered them. The, the one in particular I'm thinking of is when he had, he, he had already retired from the orphanage, but I think he was going around promoting perhaps that work, and he was speaking in various places about the power of prayer and trusting in the Lord. And as they were on their way, they got locked into this fog, and he said to the captain of the ship, who's a Christian, we should go down in the hold and we should pray for this fog, that the Lord would lift it. And the uh, captain of the ship, thinking in his mind, there's, there's really no way we're going to get out of this fog. There's, there's no way that, that God's going to answer this prayer. And when they went down in the hold and prayed, first of all, George Mueller prayed. And when he prayed, he, he just said, Lord, please lift this fog so we can make it to this place. And then the captain began to pray. And he said, you don't need to pray because I've already asked the Lord. And I know that you don't believe he's going to answer this prayer, but I know he has already answered this prayer. We don't need to pray anymore. And they went up on, on the deck of the ship and the fog was gone. And he got to the place where he, where he was going. See, there's no way, I think, that we could be able to trust God for something like that because our faith hasn't grown to that place. And the only way it grows to that degree is by trusting him for the small things and working our way up. As we see the answers to prayer, we know that he will answer those prayers that we're offering to him now. So being in the word, being in prayer, but also praise. And I wanted to add this one because I think it's very important. How often do you spend singing to the Lord? And, and why would you do that anyway? Uh, Edwards once asked that question. Why does the Lord command us to sing in our worship? Why do we, why do we sing songs? Why don't we just recite passages of Scripture? do, you know, the um, alternate readings in, in the Psalms and so forth. Why do we sing? Well, to Edwards, the answer seemed obvious. Singing has a way of stirring up our affections that reciting doesn't. That's also, by the way, why the Lord wants his word preached rather than read or, or just simply lectured because it tends to stir the heart more than just hearing a straight reading. The more that we are engaged in praise, the more our hearts are going to be stirred. And the more that our affections are uh, stirred, the stronger we are going to become spiritually. Again, because of the work of the Holy Spirit, because of his illuminating word. Now, there's really no way around this. Not that we want to find a way around it. There's no substitute for these things. We cannot be strong Christians if we're not in the word and not in prayer and not in praising. If we want to overcome the attacks of the enemy and be spiritually strong, we do need to, first of all, resist his temptations to sin and to be drawn into things that are worthless. And we need to spend more time with the Lord in the things he has given to us to strengthen the work of the Holy Spirit. We could, of course, add to the ones we've already looked at, fellowship. Fellowship. Obey the Lord. Be in his word, be in prayer, be in praise, and be in fellowship. If we do these things, we will soon find the strength that we are looking for to serve the Lord because the illuminating work of the Holy Spirit will be stronger in our lives. Again, that's the only way. If you want to be strong, 
That's what we need to do. So may the Lord help us to do these things and to get out of the vicious circle and into the virtuous one. Well, let's, uh, let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we?